Hi again, my name's Andy. Radios like this have to accommodate a considerable range of radio frequencies. Those frequencies vary in wavelength from around 10 feet to over a mile in length. And it's not practical to have a simple amplifier that accommodates all of these frequencies. People have established very clever ways of overcoming this problem and one of them is to resolve all of the frequencies down to a common denominator and uh, that is the intermediate frequency. And in this video I want to talk a little bit of how the intermediate frequency is generated and also want to show you uh, a way of thinking about circuits to make them a little bit easier to understand. And continuing the journey through the circuit diagram of this uh, GEC BC5645 radio. Components marked in red are those parts of the circuit that we've already looked at. This circuit shows the VHF amplifier and the frequency changer section. We've already seen these items marked in red, so we'll get rid of them. And we'll just tidy up a few things along the way. I've already talked about the screen grid, that's the second grid up from the bottom, so uh, we can get rid of that. And we can get rid of the components that feed it, because we've discussed those. Uh, in the same way, we've talked about the suppressor grid, the top grid, so we can get rid of that and we can get rid of its connection to ground as well. There's that uh, tricky little internal shield uh, down there on the right of the valve as well. It's also caused some confusion so that can go. And again we can dispense with the earth connection to that uh, shield. Whilst we're tidying up we can get rid of that uh, RF bypass capacitor across the filament and uh, uh, its connections to ground. While we're at it we'll get rid of that uh, second cathode connection. Things we've got rid of so far are not going to affect the performance of the circuit. They're all components that enhance the performance of the valve and uh, they'll have static voltages uh, on them they don't affect the fundamental function of the circuit. What I'm setting out to do here is show you a, another way of looking at the circuit and just tidying your mind as to what it is you're actually looking at. If we look at the three capacitors at the bottom, we've got the variable capacitor and uh, these two capacitors that I've just lit up red. All that the red capacitors are doing are uh, giving us the correct value across the variable capacitor. So uh, we know their capacitors in parallel. Um, we don't need to see them, they can go. While we're at it, we'll get rid of that little blue dotted line that just tells us that that capacitor is ganged with another capacitor. That capacitor up on the uh, top left, that's uh, the input signal that's coming from the RF amplifier. Uh, we can forget about that for the time being, but uh, we'll leave a reminder that it's there because uh, we are interested in it, but not right now. And let's tidy up some of those jagged lines on the right hand side. I'm not really bothered about those at the moment, so we'll, uh, we'll dim those out a bit. We'll come back to them, but uh, we don't want it getting in the way right now. Okay, if we turn our attention to uh, the tuning capacitor there, uh, I want to move it. I'll move it over to the left and uh, connect it to the same wire and uh, get rid of that one that we saw in the first place. So that's exactly the same circuit as it was. So now I want to take this group of components and push them all over to the right. Just tidies it up a little bit. So I'm going to connect the top of the variable capacitor to the top of the coil there 
and uh, I'm going to take away that wire and I'm going to take away that wire and uh, that capacitor that comes from the top of the core to the grid I'm going to put one in there and in fact what I'm going to do is take that one away there so I've just moved that so it's in the, the same place as it was before so that's the same circuit and okay I don't like where that resistor is uh, that one so uh, I'm going to move that over to there and uh, I need to connect it up to the same place and I need to remove the uh, the original one so again that is exactly the same circuit as it was before we'll just uh, shorten some of those wires and uh, tidy that up and we'll just tidy up the uh, the HTDC so now you can look at that and you you could say oh yeah that's that's a Hartley oscillator it was a bit difficult to see before and just to remind us how complicated it looked on the original circuit diagram here it is okay let's get rid of that so I don't know about you but I think this is a lot easier to look at okay I'll hang some labels on some of these components so as we can discuss them so that resistor let's call it R that's holding the control grid down to ground potential it uh, happens to be a 47,000 ohm resistor the inductor L is part of the tuned resonance circuit and that works in conjunction with C1, the variable capacitor. When the system's oscillating, the center tap of L bobs up and down in sympathy with the resonant frequency, and that, of course, is connected to the cathode of the valve. C2 connects the top of the tank circuit C1 and L it connects that tank circuit to the grid of the valve and again when uh, the tank circuit is oscillating C2 bobs up and down in sympathy with the oscillations of the tank circuit but it is electrically out of phase with the center tap of L1 so in simplistic terms you can think of the oscillations being caused by the phase shift between the top of C2 and the center tap of L1 as the tank circuit oscillates and in this particular radio uh, these oscillations are happening at many millions of times per second the anode of the valve is of course uh, also swinging high and low in potential in sympathy with the resonant frequency of the tank circuit and we have essentially a local oscillator and at this stage we have the local oscillation frequencies in the valve and on the anode of the valve okay so so far so good but you remember we have the tuned radio frequency signal coming in on that capacitor on the top left and that gets superimposed onto the control grid of the oscillator valve so now in the valve we've got the local oscillator frequency and we've got the RF in the radio frequency signal coming in and just to make it a little bit more complicated we also have a mixture of the local oscillator and the radio frequency signal added together and if that's not enough we also have a frequency that's equal to the local oscillator frequency minus the radio frequency but that's okay we can separate those out because all of those signals have to try and get through the IF transformer in the anode circuit and that again is a tuned radio frequency and only the 
frequency that correctly matches the tuned IF transformer frequency will be imparted to the rest of the circuit. If you saw the video with the earlier demonstration you'll know that when the frequency coming into the tuned circuit matches the frequency of the tuned circuit we have maximum voltage uh, across uh, that circuit and in this case we have the maximum voltage across the primary of the transformer and that links with the secondary of the transformer shown there and again that is a tuned secondary so uh, the frequency has to be correct otherwise it won't get through to the rest of the circuit. So we'll just complete that circuit with uh, a ground and uh, that's the intermediate frequency that's going out of the system. You'll remember at the beginning of this discussion that I explained that in order to amplify a wide range of frequencies it's necessary to reduce all of the frequencies down to a common denominator and this common denominator is the intermediate frequency. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. I hope it helps you to understand circuits a little bit better and see how you can redraw them to make them easier to understand. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.